You decide our Earth is getting a little crowded, so you visit the world design store, Magrathia Corporations, in hopes of buying a planet all for yourself. You are greeted by a shop assistant who offers you a catalog of options. Would you like a planet made of pure platinum or gold? Or maybe one with a layer of fish on top? You explain you're looking for something more affordable, perhaps a planet as small as Little Princess Asteroid. The assistant frowns and reminds you that, being an Earthling, you'd feel really uncomfortable living in a place with much lower gravity than there is on Earth. She explains the only way to generate the same downward pull is by piling enough matter underneath you. Since the force of gravity is proportional to an object's mass, you would feel unnaturally light on a planet that tiny. Moreover, she adds, Magathea Corporations is legally bound by the Imperial Galactic Government to only sell planets where the client can live in their natural gravitational conditions. Despondent, you turn around to leave. There's no way you're buying a planet the size of Earth. But the assistant stops you at the door. Don't panic. Magathea Corporations has a special material in their inventory called Thick Brick. Thick Brick is incredibly dense, so you could make a planet a thousand times smaller than Earth with the same gravity. And luckily for you, Thick Brick is one of their cheapest options since no one wants to carry it around. This offer is exactly what you were looking for, and you're about to finalize your order for Earth 2.0 when another thought crosses your mind. Can my planet have any shape I'd like? you ask. Ooh, yes, the assistant beams. May I interest you in a flat Earth? We can put it on several elephants, even add a turtle if you'd like. Or how about a bagel? A trefoil knot? There's been a recent trend for a dodecahedra among our clients. Or we could make you Escher's infinite staircase so you don't need to worry about getting good exercise. We just need to make the planet big enough so that there's a spot somewhere on it with Earth's gravity. You ask for a minute to think things through and pull out your notebook. You don't care what your planet would look like from outer space, but you're wondering if you could save even more cash by using a different shape. After all, you only need Earth's 1g gravity at a single point while a round planet has the same downward force everywhere on its surface. Surely, there must be a way to use less thick brick if you only care about the gravity at one spot. So the question becomes, given a particular chunk of matter, how should you shape it to maximize the gravitational field at a single point? Pause and give it a try. With a notebook, you can surely puzzle it out. By the way, the force of gravity between two point masses is given by this formula where the m's are the respective masses, r is the distance between the points, and big G is a particular constant. And when we say 1g gravity, we really mean that the part of this formula without the little m is equal to what it is on the surface of the Earth. We would like to mold our chunk of matter in such a way that it pulls on you as forcefully as possible. The solution would then allow us to attain Earth's gravitation with the least amount of thick brick. The task before you might appear infeasible. With all the shapes out there, how could you ever find the one you need? It may help to imagine you've already discovered and bought the optimal option. What can you deduce about the planet beneath your feet? For starters, let's specify the direction the force of gravity is pulling you. We'll call it down, whatever that means. What causes this force? Well, every bit of thick brick in the planet tugs you toward itself and all these tugs combine into the net downward pull. Here you might notice that it makes no sense to have any thick brick above you since it would only diminish the net force by tugging you up. This leads to a small but useful observation about the dream shape. It has to lie entirely below you. In other words, if we split the universe into two half spaces with a horizontal plane passing through you, all the thick brick should end up in the bottom half. Intuitively, if you want to maximize the gravitational pull, you should stash lots of matter underneath yourself. What exactly is underneath? You could try standing on top of a long pole, but that feels like a waste of all the space just to your side. If instead you try a flat disk, as the shop assistant suggested, you run into the opposite problem. You'd probably be better off filling some of the space directly below you instead of placing thick brick way out on your left and right. Notice that in our criticism of the pole and the disk, we've introduced the notion of better and worse uses of matter. A bit of thick brick close by contributes a stronger gravitational pull than it would if placed far away. Similarly, matter directly below you adds more to the net downward force than matter off to the side. You might say there's a kind of hierarchy among all the points in space, and the ones near the top of the list should be occupied first. 
Since it has infinitely many entries, our hierarchy can't really be written down. In fact, we won't know where to start if we set out to list even part of it. Because space is continuous, there is no closest point to begin with. Still, thinking of the ordering as something tangible might help us find the optimal shape. Once you understand the hierarchy structure, you'll know exactly what the optimal planet should look like. It never hurts to start small, so let's zoom in on a single level in our list. Returning to the imagined optimal planet, we'll consider the lowest level with Thick Brick in it. Of course, some spots are just as good as others. You would expect an entire set of points sharing the step in the hierarchy. If you draw a straight line from your position to one of them, point P, you can immediately say which part of the line belongs to the optimal planet. The closer Thick Brick is to you on this ray, the stronger downward pull it creates. Since thick brick at P would contribute the smallest acceptable force, only the segment from U to P is part of the planet on the entire ray. We've just stumbled upon another property of our shape, namely, the target planet has no holes. Any line through your position has a single continuous chunk intersecting our shape. So the hierarchy level we're interested in is really the surface of this shape or the crust of the optimal Earth. Suppose a bit of thick brick anywhere in this shell contributes a small downward force tiny f to the gravity at your location. What sort of shape do all such points form? Well, if the spot 3 feet down and a foot to your right belongs to this set, so does the spot 3 feet down and a foot to your left. Moreover, the set must then include the entire horizontal circle 3 feet below you. Since the rest of the points on this circle are equally far from you and create the same angle with the vertical, Thick brick in each of them pulls you down with a force of tiny f as well. In fact, the shape we're examining, and therefore the entire planet, should be symmetric about the vertical axis passing through you. That is, there's no reason for the surface beneath your feet to look differently if you spin around on the spot. Besides narrowing down the pool of potential shapes, our realization makes the question a whole dimension easier. Instead of worrying about all the ways to arrange thick brick in 3D, Let's slice the shape with a plane that includes the central vertical axis. Why this plane and not any other? It has a special property. It houses a representative point from each of the horizontal circles. Thus, because of the axial symmetry, we'll only need to find the intersection of our shape with this plane to know everything about it. Okay, you say, so what is this intersection? We've been putting it off for as long as possible, but this is the time to reference the formula I mentioned at the start of our exploration. With this equation, you'll find the exact shape of the intersection which generates the tiny f hierarchy level and ultimately the entire dream planet. Let's replace the big M with tiny m to stand for the mass of a bit of thick brick. We'll also put my instead of the other m to signify your mass. Anyway, um, we'd like to grab the set of points for which this equation is equal to tiny f. But wait! We forgot that thick brick not on the axis pulls at you diagonally, so only a component of its force contributes to the downward gravity. And for all the points in our graph, this component is what needs to equal tiny f. We'll have to modify our formula. Instead of considering the entire sideways force, let's take its projection onto the axis to obtain the component we're looking for. Algebraically, this translates into multiplying the left side of our equation by cosine theta, theta being the angle between the direction of the pole and the vertical. So how do we graph this requirement? Regardless of the specific values of the constants, a single point on the vertical axis has to fit our formula. For simplicity, let's say this spot is one unit below you. Since thick brick plays there pulls you directly downward, we don't need to multiply by a special scaling factor, and the formula reduces to g tiny m m y equals tiny f. For any point on the graph, we can equate this product to the full expression with the corresponding angle and radius. The downward component of the force must always match tiny f. After cancelling out equal terms and rearranging the variables, we arrive at the neat polar equation r equals the square root of cosine theta. Ta-da! You circle your answer triumphantly and rush over to the shop assistant, eager to place an order for Earth 2.0. You explain your planet should have axial symmetry, no holes, and a surface modeled by the discovered polar equation. Magrathia corporations will have to scale the shape up until the maximum gravity reaches g, which would change the formula to r equals d square roots of cosine theta, where d is the distance from u to the lowest point of the planet. To be clear, all you need to do to recover the entire 3D shape from this curve 
is spin it around the axis and then fill up the insides with thick brick. This produces a slightly squashed figure, almost like a dewdrop atop a leaf, with the point of maximum gravity in the middle of the squashed side. The shop assistant gives you an odd look, but promises Earth 2.0 will be ready within a Magrathian week. You swipe your Dino Charge card at the counter and parade out of the store. Um, what exactly are you so happy about? Sorry to break it to you, but the optimal option you bought is just 7.4% cheaper than a spherical planet, and it only has the gravity you're used to at a single point. Figuring out the price ratio is a matter of integration. I leave the details here for anyone up for a calculus exercise. You may have noticed how close the shape you found is to a sphere. Drop a round ball of dough onto the table, and you've got Earth 2.0. There's an even tighter relationship between the two Earths. Have you tried removing the square root from your polar equation? Now we're interested in the points that are cosine theta away in the theta direction. But cosine theta is precisely the length of the leg adjacent to theta in a right triangle with a hypotenuse of 1. Can you find the same triangle on our diagram? Connect a point that fits the equation to the point 1 unit below you and you're looking at a triangle with one side of length 1 and another of length cosine theta with the angle between them equal to theta. Our two triangles must be congruent since they share a pair of sides and the angle in between. Therefore, this floating angle must be right for every point we wish to mark. But in right triangles, the hypotenuse is twice the length of the median, so all our points are one half away from the point half a unit beneath you. Similarly, any point one half away from point M forms one of these right triangles. Thus, the new equation generates a circle of unit diameter. As you can see, taking out the square root transforms our dewdrop into a ball. Hey, even though you didn't save too much on your purchase, you've just unraveled the solution to a tricky puzzle, insight by insight. Plus, You'll soon have a one-of-a-kind planet you can brag about and put in your resume.